Hello everyone, we are today at the Military History Museum of the Bundeswehr in Dresden and this is an Su-76M, which was after the T-34 the most produced Soviet armored fighting vehicle in the Second World War. Now this is a KDW model, as you can see, which was used by the National People's Army of the German Democratic Republic, better known as Eastern Germany, or commonly known. And according to Zaloga, the the Germans received about 200 vehicles of this variant. So what was the origin of the Su-76M? There are at least two important points to consider here. Namely that the Red Army needed a self-propelled gun and light tanks became mostly obsolete. First, the need for a self-propelled gun. The Red Army had developed various self-propelled guns prior to 1941, yet none of them were produced in large numbers. In 1941, there were various improvised designs of self-propelled guns, yet again in limited numbers. In the early 1942, requirements for a self-propelled gun using a light tank chassis were outlined. It should support mechanized troops against tanks, trenches, strong points and enemy troops. This would lead to the prototype of the Su-32, which was completed in July 1942. And it looked very similar to the later Su-76M. Note that SU stands for Samokayongnya Ustanovka, which means self-propelled mount according to the logo or self-propelled installation according to other sources. The second major factor was that light tanks became mostly obsolete. The Battle of Kurs gave the main armored vehicle directorate a lot to think about. Doubts about the effectiveness of the Soviet light tanks began to creep in. The T-70B light tank had little chance of success in battle with not just enemy heavy tanks, but medium ones as well. The effectiveness of the T-80 light tank that was just entering production in Factory 40 with great difficulty was also in question. This led to an order from the State Defense Committee in August 1943 that light tank production should be stopped and the resources focused on the production of the Su-76M. When I looked at the development history, I got a bit confused as such I tried to condense it down to some fundamentals, especially since the vehicle designation changed several times. So the initial development classification was SU-12. The prototype was finished in November 1942. Production was approved in December 1942. This was before extensive testing was completed. In May 1943, the Su-12 was accepted into army service under the designation Su-76. Yet there were major issues with this model, like the side-by-side -side engine configuration, which was changed to couple the engines together in one line. As such, at factory number 38, a revised Su-76 version got the designation Su-15. This version was further changed by reducing the thickness of the armor and removing the roof on the fighting compartment which led to the designation Su-15M. Finally, in July 1943, the State Defense Committee ordered the production of the Su-15M, which at first was called again Su-76, but then designated Su-76M. For the sake of brevity and sanity, various side project competitors and others are not shown here. Note that in wartime documents often just Su-76 is used, although that is technically incorrect, and only a comparable small number of around 600 Su-76 were built, in contrast to the more than 12,000 Su-76M that were built until June 1945. Such simplified naming was not uncommon in wartime documents. For instance, the T-34s were often just called T-34 in documents, and thus not indicating if they had a 76 or 85mm gun. By the way, looking at German reports, it seems that the various designations were either used by the Red Army personnel as well, or leaked intentionally. A German document from February 1944 notes that the self propelled gun with the 7.62 cm gun was originally called Su-15. In a later document with the title Typenbezeichnung für sowjetrussische Sturmgeschütze, type designation of Soviet Russian assault guns, from May 1944 the following is noted. In this regard, it is noted that the 7.62 cm assault gun, however, was initially called Su-12 or Su-15 by prisoners in general, but later was consistently called Su-76, which captured regulations confirm. Here I want to take a short moment to thank all my Patreon and subscribers and supporters that make it possible for me to go to the German military archives, where I got this document from. 
Without them, videos like this wouldn't be possible. As you can imagine, the development history is quite complicated and maybe something for a future video. It is important to mention that there were various issues and Stalin personally intervened not only in the design. Yet he also signed a decree which included the punishment of its designer and orders. For the irresponsible proposal of mass production of the SU-76 and improvements made to it, the People's Commissar of Tank Production, Comrade Salzmann, will receive a reprimand. Comrade Salzmann is warned that further omissions regarding the quality of armored fighting vehicles will result in strict punishment. The designer of the SU-76 self-propelled gun, Comrade Ginzburg, is to be removed from his post at the People's Commissariat of Tank Production, forbidden from further design work and sent to the People's Commissariat for Defense to be assigned to the active army. Ginzburg was, according to Zaloga, the only previous of a tank designer that had survived the Great Purge. After the mentioned order, he was assigned as a deputy commander for technical matters of a tank brigade. He was killed in action shortly afterwards in early August 1943. Now the question is, what is the SU-76M? Is it a tank destroyer? After all, it looks similar to the German Marder tank destroyers. Or is it more similar to an assault gun like the Sturmgeschütz 3? Or is it more of a self-propelled artillery like a German Vespa or US M7 Priest? According to the logo, its role was closer to the original German Sturmgeschütze as close support for the infantry. Yet unlike the Sturks, the SC-76M had a weak frontal armor. Furthermore, the gun optics were standard sword field artillery sights, which were not ideal for direct fire according to one source and not ideal for firing at moving targets as stated by another. In any case, it seems rather unsuited for anti-tank duties. A look at the gun might reveal a bit more information. Now this is a CIS-8 gun, 76mm which is a variant of the CIS-3 gun, and in the performance, it is basically the same. Now, some people assume this is a dedicated anti-tank gun or anti-tank gun, which is not correct. It's a multi-purpose gun. It can be used for anti-tank purposes, but the dedicated anti-tank gun of the Soviets in the Second World War was the CIS-2 gun, the 57 millimeter one. Now, by 1943 standards, you would say 76 millimeter gun is not that great, but you need to consider that this is a light tank chassis. So considering the circumstances, this vehicle packs quite a punch. Now considering that the 76 mm CIS-3 was simply the latest in a long line of Russian slash Soviet divisional guns, tracing its interest back to the 3 inch 76 model 1902. The rather weak armor and the side configuration of the gun, in terms of capabilities, yet also in configuration of using the standard artillery of the division, on a light tank chassis, the SU-76M is actually closer to the Vespa than the Sturmgeschütz, in my opinion. Another point that speaks against the tank destroyer classification is the fact that at one point there were plans to also make a variant with the 57mm CIS-2 anti-tank gun. The main project was the SU-12, an assault gun with a CIS-3 cannon. The installation of an, of an IS-1, this was an altered CIS-2 anti-tank gun, was also considered but never put into practice. So what was the role of the SU-76M? The SU-76 was designed primarily to provide fire support for the rifle divisions. The service manual for the SU-76 lists its four main tactical missions. The structure of enemy troops, suppression and destruction of enemy's infantry, fire support weapons and artillery, combat with enemy tanks and mechanized vehicles, and attack of enemy bunkers and strong points. Similarly, in a document about the use of self-propelled gun regiments, the commander of the 4th Ukrainian Front noted, when self-propelled guns SU-76 cooperate with infantry, the SU-76 should be viewed as an infantry support weapon that is less vulnerable and more mobile than regimental towed artillery. Yet the German perception of the SU-76 as a tank destroyer or at least as a threat to tanks is not completely off, especially considering how numerous this vehicle was. The same document states, on the offensive, as in the defense, when enemy tanks or self-propelled guns appear, SU-76 batteries ignore all other objectives and fire immediately at the enemy tanks or self-propelled guns. The order of opening fire is covered by existing manuals on tank combat. This task remains a priority until all enemy tanks are suppressed or chased off. Well, let us look at the vehicle now. Here in the front you can see the driver's hatch. 
During combat, this was of course closed and the driver would look through the prismatic MK4 periscope. To the left side of the driver were the fuel tanks, to the right side of the driver was the engine with the powertrain. So this was not a particularly comfortable spot, yet definitely better than being in the infantry. The driving compartment and the fighting compartment were joined by a small door, so that the driver could exit that direction if necessary. So let us take a look at the other side. So this is the fighting compartment. As you can see, there's a small door below the gun. I'm not allowed to enter the vehicle, as such I can't give you a closer look and definitely can't do a shift and tank is on fire test run. The commander would be located on the right side. He had two vision devices. One periscope with a general observation with no magnification. This is what you can see here. Sadly, the TR-1 4 power trench periscope is missing. It was rather thin and stuck out at the top, a bit to the right of the other vision device. It had a stadiometric reticle for estimating ranges. Note that this part here, which looks like an antenna mount, might be a post-war addition by Soviets or East German troops. I looked at various wartime photos and couldn't see it, yet also the SU-76M of the Tank Museum in Bovington, which was captured in the Korean War, does not have it, nor the SU-76M at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. Instead of this antenna mount, there was a similar looking one that was located on the outside. As you can see, in this case, you see the welding mark still on this vehicle where it was originally mounted. Likely this was a post modification. Also notice that this is a cutaway model for training purposes. Here you can see a small lever. This could open the firing slit for the DT machine gun or a submachine gun. The rack for the submachine gun was located on the right side. To the right below of the firing slit there was storage space for, mag for machine gun magazines. Note I don't know if the racks on the right and left hand side are original here. And here on the left side, you can also see the mounting for the left side for a firing slit. The gunner would be on the left side and operating the gun. The loader would be behind him. The gun had a traverse of 36 degrees and the elevation reached from minus 5 to 15 degrees. Here you can see the wheels of the gun elevation and traverse. The optics would be located above those wheels. Yet, as so often in museums, they are missing. The important point about this is that according to Zaloga, these gun sites would have been standard field artillery sites, which would use a different system that, than direct fire guns. In case you wonder how the crew communicated with each other, well, the crew was connected via TPU-3R intercom system. As a result, the crew in combat wore the usual sort of tank crew canvas helmet, which included earphones and throat mic. Sounds definitely more comfortable than a kick in the shoulder. Let us look at the chassis. The chassis of the SU-76M was based on the modernized T-70 hull. It was a bit lengthened and as such a sixth road wheel was added. Now during development on special request of Stalin, a roof was added, but as you can see here, this is an open top vehicle. The roof created various problems with ventilation, which earned at least in one report the vehicle a rather nasty nickname. Yet, as Yuri Pasholok points out, this was not the reason for the removal of the roof. The removal of the roof was mainly due to reduction of weight, where some authors point out that it was due to the ventilation issue, which seems to be not the case. Now, Saloga points out that the re removal of the roof was quite controversial and some crews added improvised roofs during the war. Next we look at the armor, which is certainly the weakest part of the SU-76M and it doesn't seem to be documented particularly well either. We ran into some severe differences in the sources, which led to further inquiries and measurements. I particularly want to thank Peter Samsonov, Jens Wehner and Tilo Meissner here for either providing data or manually measuring the SU-76M at the Military History Museum in Dresden. So first off, the armor well is according to one book. Keep in mind these are partially incorrect. The upper half front had 25mm and 35mm on the lower front. The side had 25mm and the rear had 15mm. Yet according to Peter referring to a Russian publication, the lower front is just 30mm. The 35mm value would be the value of the earlier 
SU-76, yet not the SU-76M. Yet we wanted to make sure this is correct, so we got out the ruler, or better Tilo and Jens did. The upper half front is like stated 25mm. The lower half front is likely 30mm as Peter's source stated, but hard to tell due to the valve. It could also be just 25mm, as you can see here. Sadly we do not have a different access to the plate. The rear armor is 50mm as stated in the book. Interestingly enough, the side armor of the fighting compartment is only 10mm. So the rear is stronger than the side and yes we double checked, we don't really know why this is the case. Maybe it had to do something with balancing the weight or something, if anyone knows please let us know. Yet back to the hull. The side armor of the hull apparently is not 25mm as stated in the book but 50mm. Again here likely the SU-76 values were used. The red arm is main armored vehicle directorate. The organization responsible for self propelled guns as of late April 1943 considered the cause to be excess weight. In addition some ideas for improvement came up after studying captured German equivalents of the SU-15, the Marder 2 and 3. A decision was made to reduce the armor thickness to 25mm in front and 13 to 50mm on the sides. This was enough to protect the crew from small arms fire. The next aspect is mobility. The SU-76M has a total horsepower of 140 and a combat weight of 10.5 metric tons. So a horsepower to ton ratio of 13.3. In comparison the German self propeller artillery gun Vespe has a ratio of 12.7. The Marder 3 Ausführung M has 14.8. The Panzer 4 F2 has 13. And the Panther has 13.4. So it has a rather good ratio. The range is given with 150 to 320 km by one source. A German wartime report notes 200 km on bad roads and 250 km on good roads. The engine were actually two engines coupled together. Note that in the earlier version, namely the SU-76, there was one engine on the right and the other on the left side of the driver. Whereas in the SU-76M, the engines are on the right and the fuel tanks are on the left side. To summarize, the SC-76M was a self-propelled infantry support gun in the Red Army that was produced in large numbers. With more than 12,000 produced until the end of the Second World War and thus being only second to the T-34 in terms of Soviet armored fighting vehicles produced, it is not surprising that this vehicle served on nearly all major fronts of the Red Army during the Second World War. Also since it was rather weakly armored and used in large numbers, there were considerable losses. Less than half of the SC-76s manufactured during the war survived, with combat losses of about 8,500. The Red Army still had 5,841 SC-76s in service in November 1947. It was clearly no wonder weapon and had various flaws, yet it provided considerable more firepower than the light tanks it replaced. Additionally, since it had a multi-purpose gun, it could engage anti-tank guns indirectly but could also provide direct fire support for the infantry against machine guns if needed. As such, the SU-76M was likely crucial in the Red Army's war effort. Big thank you here to Jens Wehner and the Military History Museum of the Bundeswehr in Dresden. Thank you as well to my Patreon and subscribers and supporters for providing financial support to making trips like this possible. As always, Sources are linked in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.